My name is Walt Shaw. I want to talk to you about our package Zigzag Boomerang. So what is this about? It's a sampler uh, back and for Bayesian inference. So in Bayesian inference you compute uh, either by hand or through a probabilistic programming environment your posterior as the density. And that's uh, not yet a useful form. You first need to sample it. I create random samples from it and these random samples then answer the questions you might have about what's uh, my posterior uh, distribution of my parameter given the observations I have. So here you see our sampler in action uh, and it's quite different from what you have seen before perhaps. So apparently there's a particle moving continuously and then at some times, random times, at it uh, changes direction and that prevents it to go too far into the tails of the distribution and the direction changes are tuned in a way that the occupation time of the particle, the time it spends in each uh, area of the real line is uh, approximating or uh, sampling from the density we are interested in. So the histogram will approach the density you see in the background which comes from your Bayesian problem. And I will uh, argue that this is a quite competitive approach, but it becomes really interesting uh, if you focus on two things we can do, which otherwise would be quite difficult, and that's uh, a form of parallel inference and then high dimensional variable selection. Started by two Dutch scientists in Eindhoven with their paper Rejection Free Monte Carlo Sampling for General Potentials. And rejection free refers to what you have seen on the previous slide that the particle never stands still. And uh, the only thing which happens are uh, that it might reflect or might not reflect, but it's always in movement. So the first paper on the topic 2012 about the starting of Julia. And then a bit later it uh, took off in uh, Great Britain with some familiar names working on it. Here the zigzag process, you have already seen uh, the sample of it. And uh, a second paper, also familiar names, Sebastian Vollmer, you know, from the machine uh, learning kit uh, mlj.jl. Bouncy particle sampler is very similar to the zigzag, you will see this in a moment. So we started working on the package last year and also started with research on that topic. And uh, so uh, in March we put out our paper which uh, explains the uh, variable selection part of the talk today. And this is uh, joint work um, with these colleagues and Sebastiano Grazzi, uh, with whom I'm collaborate on that package, Zigzag Boomerang. So I want to put uh, stress that this is an entirely practical um, package. So if you have your posterior uh, maybe encoded in a probabilistic programming language such as SOSS, then you can use zigzag boomerang to sample from it. But you can do a bit more. And I have here a model of SOSS, uh, which describes something like a, a regression. There's a regression line with intercept alpha and uh, slope beta some regressors x and you observe them with noise. But uh, there's a spike and slap right here. So apparently you're not quite sure if the parameter alpha belongs to the model or not, and the, if the model should have a slope or not, a parameter beta. And the spike and slap just says that uh, a priori there's a certain probability that the parameter alpha is zero and a certain probability that it belongs to the model and then is sampled a priori from a normal distribution. So you write down your posterior. Uh, I just introduced some notation as a parameter x, and I'm using the L of x for the log likelihood or the log posterior, and I never give the data a letter. And you can use then our sampler zigzag boomerang to sample from that posterior, and uh, it does so even that there are spike and slap trials. It samples exactly. You call mean of trace to get the um, posterior mean from the samples, and as this is a variable selection problem, you can also compute the inclusion probabilities. What's the probability that my parameter alpha or beta are not equal to zero? So uh, the picture in the first slide was maybe a bit misleading. Uh, so what's the work we actually have to do? And I want to illustrate with the trace, uh, which is returned by the sampler, that we only have to uh, 
look at the process at certain times, not at all times, it's a continuous process, but essentially we only need to know uh, something about interesting times. For example, the times where the process changes direction, these are uh, the important times to reconstruct the trajectory. So the trace contains a tuple, a vector of tuples, which contain times, a coordinate which is affected by the event, and then the new position and the new direction of the coordinate every time it changes direction. So uh, how, uh, how, how does it work? So the six example, the starting point is ingredient number one, that simple deterministic dynamics. There's a particle moving through space without any force acting on it, and then it just, well, it moves away and never comes back, so this is not yet a sampler. But uh, it has very simple dynamics, so for example, we can say exactly that the occupation time, uh, the time it spends everywhere, corresponds to uniform distribution, uh, improper uniform distribution on the entire space. Uh, we need some second ingredient, and uh, you have already seen, uh, we have to add the reflections, and the reflection then uh, turn the uh, uniform distribution, which you have seen before, into the distribution you actually want to sample from. So uh, I want to say that this particle, uh, whether it reflects or not, that depends on the uh, gradient of the potential. So here I have drawn the potential minus log the posterior density or minus log the density you want to sample from, and now the particle uh, moves along that line drawn in the potential. And essentially, we check at random time points whether we want to change direction or not. Think of this particle as a hiker which really dislikes uh, going uphill. So if it goes uphill and at these expectation points the gradient becomes too steep, then there's always a chance that it turns around. But if it goes downhill, then it will never change direction. So we can use this sampler. So here you see a continuous approximation to such a spike and slab. So instead of having a direct measure at zero, there's a continuous component. And now our sampler uh, uh, is sampling from this distribution. But you see that it has to do quite a bit of work. And that's typical for any gradient-based um, sampler will uh, choke on a continuous approximation to the spike on slab because the gradient here becomes so high. So can we do something better? And there comes the unique strength of our sampler into play. So uh, just some notation here. We have the uh, spike and slab measure. So one dimensional, uh, one component there is a continuous function called smooth density for the slab with a certain weight. And then the remaining weight is sitting on a Dirac measure at zero, an atom. That's the probability that the parameter is zero and does not belong to the model. Um, so we want to sample from density, but you have to ask density with respect to what? So densities uh, here, f of x, density in x of a prob uh, probability distribution is typically given as probability of a small area around x or small volume around x divided by the volume itself. But you can also normalize your density and express it with respect to something else. And something which often happens is that people express the density of the posterior with respect to the prior. So here, the L is the log density of the posterior, which uh, tells us how much mass the posterior charges in a very small area around x compared to, to the mass the prior would charge. And that's something we can totally write down for the spike and slap prior. So our uh, so let's do uh, the same game again. Let's start with very simple dynamics. So here we still have a particle moving through space, but then when it passes in zero, it just spends some time there. You see that this preserves a uniform with an atom in zero and a uniform on the real line. Now we only have to add the right amount of reflections to sample our density. And that um, now that we express the density with respect to the spike and slab measure, there is no singularity anymore. The singularity is sitting in the reference measure in the prior. And now we can run our sampler, which has this uh, dynamics, and it just has the same reflection rules as before. But every time it spans a zero, it uh, passes zero, it spends some time there. And I want to point out that if it goes through zero, 
it stops and then it continues its movement. So even if you take a break, you're not losing momentum, which is very good for mixing. So you see how the uh, uh, occupation density approximates what we want to explore. Approximate. So of course we are not really after the 1D case, so we have to think how to generalize this to higher dimensions. So here I'm doing essentially the same. I right? only have now a spike and slap zigzag process for each of uh, the 100,000 pixels of that picture here, where you can already see what it uh, represents. And then my sampler trace, it's still the same. Every pixel is moving up and down, just like our process have moved left to right in the previous picture. And they are moving jointly to sample the posterior, which uh, comes from the following model. So I have a um, signal and noise, there is some signal which is observed with um, independent random Gaussian noise and you can already see what the signal is. And one uh, property here is that most of the pixels are black and the signal is only in a small region so it's meaningful to put a spike and slap prior on the color of the pixel with the spike uh, encoding that the pixel is probably black, most of the pixels are black. And then the model is, uh, if X is our image matrix, then Y is our observation, which has Gaussian noise on it. And we want to sample from a density with respect to this product of these Dirac and Lebesgue the measures. And then there's a bit of additional thing I don't want to write down, which says that a priori also believe that neighboring pixels have colors which are related to each other. So here, uh, if you want to generalize the particle to more dimensions, so here you see a potential in the plane and a direction of movement into the direction theta. Then if you look at how this behaves along that line, it's basically the same picture as before. So we can still talk about going uphill and downhill along the potential and we still reflect if we're going too much uphill. But uh, we have two choices and the first choice is the choice of the bouncy particle sampler where we reflect at isodensity lines. So where the density is constant then we reflect like, uh, like, like a billiard. And that's one possible choice. And the other choice is the choice of the zigzag sampler, the multivariate one, where um, we don't have a, a single timer which tells us where we reflect, but we have for each coordinate an independent clock which proposes here there's the round coordinate and here's the square coordinate, let's say. And then if we move on that line, we propose independently events to do a direction change on the round coordinate or on the square coordinate. And depending on which one of these is successful first, we flip the sign in one or the other. We have two different ways of gener generalizing what we have seen in one dimension into multiple dimension, and uh, the choice is whether to have one global clock and uh, uh, one global clock taking care of the reflection and reflecting at isodensity lines. That was the bouncy particle sampler. And the other choice was the zigzag, where we have a clock for each coordinate, and then we decide uh, whether we reflect by flipping the velocity sign in the coordinate which first has a reflection event. And in one case it depends on the gradient of the uh, log density and in the other case it depends only on one coordinate, so on uh, entry of the gradient, a partial derivative of the log density. So here you see these samplers from a 2D perspective in action. So the left one I didn't talk about, but it's related to Gaussian dynamics and follows similar ideas. The right one is the bouncy, which might move in any uh, spatial direction and uh, has these reflections at the isodensity lines. And in the center panel you have the zigzag, which moves on diagonals, because every time it has a reflection event, there's just a velocity switch. So I should say that these two uh, samplers, both the bouncy and the zigzag, they are on different ends of the spectrum. And the bouncy particle, it's good because it handles difficult densities. And the zigzag has a nice property if applied to large structured systems and allows us to do the parallelism I'm talking about. 
So let's first the bouncy particle sampler. Why is it good on uh, complicated densities? Because the reflection on contour lines that does not destroy the momentum. So even if you reflect, you still keep going in a reasonable direction. You see this here that uh, the trajectory in 2D in black of the bouncy particle it gets the particle around the density. Similar to the Hamiltonian dynamics, which is a dotted, where uh, following Hamiltonian dynamics, your particle explores quite well the uh, different regions of the density, and that's the basic of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo methods. And now, uh, what's nice about the six x so, uh, let's look at graphical models where the log density typically have the form of the sum over functions which uh, only depends on certain variables. So f2 only depends on x1 and x2. These are the so-called factors and depend on the graphical structure of your model. And if you remember that the zigzag sampler depends on the uh, partial derivative of the log likelihood, then it's nice to see that under this partial derivative, those factors which do not depend on the uh, quadrant you take the derivative will just be zero, so they disappear. This essentially means that to make the decision whether you want to turn around in one coordinate, you only need to look at the relevant neighbors, the neighbors in the factor graph, and you can ignore all other variables. This creates an interesting form of locality which we are going to exploit. So, uh, because each of the coordinates have um, these events independently and you have to decide what happens next, if you look Inside the implementation of the zigzag sampler, there's an event queue in there. So the main loop you can imagine is something like peeking into the queue, what happens next, which coordinate has an event, and then updating locally the state of the process according to this event. So perhaps you have to flip one uh, velocity sign of one coordinate, but to decide whether this happens, you have to look at the neighboring coordinates. I uh, just want to say a bit about what we are not doing in parallelism here. So typically people look at, for example, running k-chains in parallel. That's an embarrassing parallel problem, but it also means that you have to run uh, k-chains simultaneously, and then you get k times a large state space. So we want to do something uh, different, and we are also not doing parallel tampering, but uh, that's something we could actually consider. So let's talk about what we do. So we think of we have this really large state space, and uh, the first thing is we partition the state vector. So the state vector here is a state matrix, and we partition it into sub-pictures. And uh, by construction of the priors, uh, saying that things locally are correlated, uh, the pixels inside each box are independent from the pixels in other boxes, given the yellow pixels. So these yellow pixels are something like separating sets. And uh, because our direction changes only depend on local neighborhoods, if we want to decide on a direction change of uh, a coordinate in one of the box, we certainly do not need to look at the coordinates in another box. So to some extent we can do this in parallel, and we only have to resolve if there's a coordinate change at the yellow interface, because these yellow pixels to decide whether they change direction, we have to look into both sides. But I want to point something out. While we are doing in parallel evolution of this one and this one, the process does not stand still on the uh, interface in yellow. As I said, the process is constantly in movement. The only thing is, if we want to decide whether we change direction, then we have to uh, re sort this out with a higher instance, and essentially each of these fields can uh, have one thread moving forward in time until there's some kind of conflict which has to be resolved by uh, talking to the neighbors. So if you look inside the implementation, then um, so for each of these uh, sub pictures, for each of the elements of the partition, I'm spawning an inner loop which does the zigzag sample on each of the coordinates until it runs into a conflict and then there's an outer task which um, uh, takes care of uh, stitching the, the things together and uh, telling the 
inner loops if they can continue or if they have to wait. So this is uh, a managing instance for these inner loops. And there's something interesting here. This is asynchron. So there's some asynchronicity. The um, moment where one process part reaches a certain time, uh, dip, you, you cannot really dip, uh, compare these events. So there's something like an event horizon. And as I'm asynchronously in parallel producing these reflection events, at the end of the day, I actually have to sort my trace by time to get uh, a synchronous uh, representation of my trace. So here you see uh, me on our university server. So I'm using this so I can illustrate how it works with several threads. So I'm starting Julia, maybe with 16 threads. And uh, then I run a small uh, sample problem, a bit smaller than the one with the picture. So uh, you see that this is about sampling from a Gaussian with uh, uh, 65,000 pixels. And uh, then the correlation structure is a squared and a sparse matrix to that. So I have 16 cores. You see the progress meter. It goes really fast then. And now let's wait a bit. So all the um, threads have done their work and I get my posterior mean, for example. So wait a second, it took actually a bit to compute my posterior mean. So, ah, third of a second. So just to give a relation to how fast the sampler is, it samples 20 seconds and it needs a part of a second to just compute the mean of the samples. And you see that there's 15 million reflections there. So there it is really crucial that you have uh, saved the trajectory in this compressed form so you can for example collect the first um, 10 iterates but if you try to collect all the trajectory from the compressed form into uh, one uh, element for each uh, uh, change then uh, you're exhausting your memory so julia apparently is a good way to run out of memory during uh, posterior sampling so, and uh, if you do the same for our example with the uh, noisily observed heart, then you see that um, because we have a prior on the probability that a pixel belongs to the background, it gives a, a large enough mass to the um, probability that a pixel belongs to the background, that we get uh, with the posterior mean a uh, very small error on the um, background pixel. They are almost perfectly recognized. And also, inside the area with the signal, we don't mistakenly identify pixels as background pixels. So besides uh, being very fast, it also worked from a statistical point of view. And with that, I want to say thank you. If you look into the paper, then you see some more examples. One I want to point out. Last year at JuliaCon, we had an example with the boards, which were something like birds, where one bird is in love with another bird, and they are following each other, or they are not following each other. And a statistical question might be, which bird is in love with whom? And if you want to answer that, then essentially there's a lot of combinatorial possibilities, who is following whom, but if you put a spike and slap prior on it, then you see how to solve this. So thank you.